This is episode 226 of the Stem Cell Podcast, The Egg to Embryo Transition with Dr. Edward Grow. Hey everybody, we are Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today, we have Dr. Edward Groh from the University of Texas on the podcast to talk about his research on the development of the egg and subsequent fertilized embryo. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights and stem cell news that's coming up. But first, we'd like to remind our listeners about ESC and IPSC News, one of stem cells free weekly scientific newsletters. ESC and IPSC News summarizes all the latest research, news, jobs, and events in ESC and IPSC research and delivers it right to your inbox every Wednesday. Save time and keep current with ESC and IPSC News. You can subscribe free at www.escellnews.com. All right, Arun, I'm setting off the roundup today with the story, which is like really our, our bread and butter. We work in cell fate, you know, pluripotent cells. It's all about turning them into the cells you want and using them to understand fundamental aspects and facets of human development specifically. But what we're focused on is cell fate, is what the cells are. And really what that is, is a description of cell state. Okay, and, and this is a concept that goes way back. You know, we're really all just a ball of cells as these synthetic embryo stories have recently elucidated for us all and really underscored. But, you know, the idea of us just being a ball of these cells in different states is initially based on phenotypic descriptions, right? Those old school textbook diagrams of just what things look like. Um, but nowadays, these global analysis methods can connect the phenotypes that we have had described to us for millennia, or at least centuries, um, and connect those with the underlying molecular processes, right? We're talking about single cell omics, which connects that molecular to the phenotype, and with very, very fine single cell resolution. Um, and that helps us to understand how these cell states can evolve and transition into each other. You know, I'm talking about the pseudotime analysis that we're all so fond of lately in the last few years. Um, to approaching now 80 years, more than 80 years ago, that uh, Waddington in his now famous model proposed this idea of the valley and the rolling marbles describing self fate. Um, but uh, while that was really informative and has been kind of upended in, in recent uh, years with the induced pluripotent stem cells, the, the whole idea kind of leaves open the idea of why those marbles roll into certain valleys and whether or not they can revert into an initial state. Well, half that question was answered in terms of the induced pluripotent stem cells, but there's still this notion of why and mechanistically why and how. Um, there's been a lot of lineage analysis that's characterized and inferred uh, cell state transitions, either directly using, you know, classic lineage tracing or these pseudotime analyses. Um, and those efforts have shown that cell states are interconvertible. And those that interconvertibility is based on changes in like gene expression and signaling networks. However, again, there's a critical gap uh, in the knowledge of, of how or a, a lack of mechanistic understanding of how uh, the cellular networks drive cell state transitions and, and understanding that would allow us to manipulate and control these cell states. Okay, so that's the idea behind this paper, which is not a, a stem cell paper uh, per se, but it is, it is bound to have, I think, an outsized impact um, on our use and understanding of stem cells. It's from Boris Kolodenko, who's from the University College of Dublin, also has an affiliation with Yale University. Uh, and in this story, which is a Nature article that was in review for like almost two years, I wish I'd had this story a year and a half ago, I would have made use of it, um, but they, they use this uh, or develop this cell state transition assessment and regulation program, CSTAR, as they call it, which uses omics data as an input and develops a workflow that transports that input 
into a model that identifies core signaling networks uh, or a single network in some cases that controls cell fate transitions. And uh, the C-star also models how cells maneuver in this Waddington landscape. Uh, and uh, Kolodenko's group was able to show or prove the principle of this in a cellular model that was based on these, uh, there's like this uh, human neuroblastoma cell line. Uh, so they were able to use that to prove the principle and then they were able to expand it and apply it to existing uh, omics data sets like single cell seek. So, I mean, what's great about these types of stories and why I like to highlight them in the show is that they they kind of, I feel like everyone's going to get a hold of this paper and then run back to their data set and do a lot of reanalysis, which is I'm, I'm hopeful to do myself because it gives a new lens on, on which to look at existing data. And unlike the classic pseudotime analyses that have been inferred from these single cell omics data sets, I think this is much more specific in defining one or a few core signaling networks that may underlie uh, you know, the cell fate chain. So I think this is gonna be really important to overlay over all the existing omics data sets out there and maybe dig a little deeper on what the signaling networks are that control fate in those systems. Arun, what do you think? Yeah, it's a useful resource for the community. You mentioned that it's not a stem cell paper per se, but it has a lot of applications to our community, which is very interested in, of course, understanding cell fate transitions. And like you said, you know, everybody's going to use this or try to use this for their own data sets. See if you can use the C star and apply it to your own differentiation data sets. The first thing that I thought of when it comes to the applicability of the C star is actually using it for potentially understanding direct reprogramming a little bit better. Because as we know, direct reprogramming is kind of hit or miss when it comes to its efficiency. I think part of it is finding the right signaling pathways, the right transcriptional networks to actually force cells to directly become one cell type to another with a high efficiency, right? I mean, we, I, I think some some cell types and some lineages, we've done better with that, like even neural reprogramming, Marius Vernig's approach, which has become pretty pretty efficient. But for example, in my own field, cardiac reprogramming is still trying to improve. And I think figuring out the right state transitions, the right signaling networks could uh, improve those direct reprogramming efficiencies. So I can see the applications here. And you know, I think they're quite limitless for, for stem cell biology and for reprogramming. Yeah, absolutely. It drives to a deeper kind of conceptual, and maybe I'm going a little too deep into the rabbit hole here, but like, what is cell state? You know, you look at these pseudotime uh, graphs and there's cells along an entire trajectory. And I think we've moved away from thinking of cells as these discrete milestones. They all exist along a continuum. So the one thing I wonder about this when you apply the C star to all these different cellular data sets is like, where do those cells that are in the in, the in between states fall in? I guess Part of the, the, the value of this program is that it, it employs those in-betweens to try and track and, and, and figure out what the signaling networks that govern that transit are. But I, I'm just really fascinated to see if we apply this across the board to all these omics data sets, if we might not capture some other little milestones or some offshoots of the classic uh, differentiation hierarchies that we're so accustomed to and familiar with. Yeah, what you're alluding to is one of the things that terrifies me the most in stem cell biology these days, the idea that, you know, cell states are not binary. It's not like, oh, you have a stem cell and then you have a terminally differentiated cell. There's an entire slew, an entire gradient, inter intermediates, a gradient of intermediate cell types that goes from, from zero to one, right? And I think something like this is perhaps going to scare me even more from sort of the, some of the data sets you'll uncover from using the C-star application, but hey, that's part of the fun, right? We're using these approaches, we're using these technologies to really uncover a lot more about cell fate, differentiation, all the good stuff. And kind of on the same topic, um, I'm gonna be talking about a cell stem cell paper here that is you know, coming from the lab of somebody who is an icon in cell fate and cell differentiation in particular, he's pioneered some of the original differentiation approaches. This is, of course, Gordon Keller. And, uh, you know, previously at Toronto, now has affiliations with Blue Rock Therapeutics. But 
Gordon Keller and also Michael Laflamme here is, is on this paper has been really instrumental in helping develop some of those initial differentiation approaches. The title of this paper, it's a cell stem cell paper, Modeling Human Lineage, sorry, Human Multi-Lineage Heart Field Development with Pluripotent Stem Cells. Of course, I saw a heart in the title. You know, I had to take a closer look at it, sue me. Um, but this is relevant to kind of what I do, and I think relevant to a relevant data set for a lot of folks in the community, and especially in the cardiac differentiation community. What they did here was they... Um, they examined uh, the different subtypes that are found in the mammalian heart, the cardiomyocyte subtypes, which are actually derived from distinct lineages, as cardiac biologists know. Uh, we know as the first heart field, the anterior second heart field, and the posterior second heart field. And those of us who are not cardiac biologists, we're two for two on this show, uh, but for those of us who aren't cardiac biologists, the heart really undergoes this beautiful, uh, you know, dance almost during development where these separate fields of the heart, the, the first heart field, second heart field, ultimately come together in a beautiful way to create the different ventricles, the different chambers, the different segments, structures found in the heart. But the subtypes of cardiomyocytes in each of those segments in each of the heart fields, it's, it's different. They ultimately lead up to the different ventricular subtypes, different atrial subtypes of cardiomyocytes. So what they were doing here in the Keller lab was modeling human heart field development from pluripotent stem cells using a lot of single cell RNA sequencing to actually figure out lineage specification and progression. And again, kind of building on what we had just talked about when it comes to cell fate, going from A to B and trying to figure out what's in between of A to B, right? So important thing here also is they analyzed human pluripotent stem cell derived and also mouse mesoderm transcriptomes to figure out the distinct human first heart field, second heart field, and uh, you know anterior and posterior second heart field states, mesodermal cell populations, and they compare the species. So it, it, there is an evo Debo component here as well. They manipulated the different signaling pathways that they identified from the transcriptomic analyses, and they generated cardiomyocyte subpopulations that have uh, characteristics of the the key cardiomyocytes that you'd actually find ultimately in the developing heart in the real deal. So uh, they looked at the developmental trajectory of these different lineages and reproduced the the mouse developmental lineages and again identified developmental programs that are conserved between human and mouse. That's I think that's a really important thing here. So this, like the previous paper, it's a data set. It's a landscape of human embryonic cardiogenesis and also shows some conservation between mouse cardiogenesis and human cardiogenesis and really it takes a deeper dive into that. Um, ultimately, what's the translational approach here, the translational outlook? Well, since this is, and they have actually directly mentioned it in their conflicts of interest here, you know, that, you know, the Blue Rock Therapeutics has some you know, stake in this particular technology and this particular data set, that this could be really useful in generating cardiomyocytes better, okay? Generating cardiomyocytes subtypes better. And really for the, the clinical outlook, this could be really useful for modeling congenital heart disease, defects of cardiac development, which ultimately give rise to these problems in cardiac structure. And I think having the right cardiomyocytes subtypes to work with will will go a long way in helping us better understand how congenital heart disease actually arises. So again, just like the first paper, a, a useful data set for the community. Yeah, and I think illustrating the the powerhouse at Blue Rock, I mean, the, the kaleidoscope of clinical applications they have there from the Lorenz, you know, Parkinson's also a synthetic biology and, and here with Laflamme and Keller and their heart stories. I'm just so interested to see how this all plays out. You know, 20 years ago when stem cells blew up, Lorenz, Laflamme, Keller, they were the icons, right? And uh, now as we approach therapeutic application, I don't know that any kind of heart therapy is really around the corner or Parkinson's or anything, but they're the early leaders and the, and the players in this clinical landscape. So I'm always paying close attention to see how their academic output aligns with uh, 
the the clinical translation and and this is i think right there in the middle you know it's a resource that's still heavily academic but i think it it does uh show how they're marching forward yeah i think the immediate application is is like you said the academic you know this is a, a tool set a tool set to help us better understand cardiac development I think in part because when it comes to therapies for congenital heart disease, surgery is still the number one option, right? You, you're probably not going to be injecting replacement cardiac cells into these, even cardiomyocyte subtypes into these newborn kids. It's more of a matter of just fixing the structural problems of the heart. I think, you know, we've talked to Deepak Srivastava in, Pat, in the past on the show, and he has some other approaches of how you might be able to have kind of a, a prophylactic or a preventative approach to, to preventing congenital heart disease, analogous to the folic acid kind of story that was, you know, that's been well fleshed out over the years. And he's, of course, used his own data sets to identify some of these compounds that may be able to alleviate or prevent congenital heart disease from happening ever in the first place. So I think there definitely is a, a utility for, for these kind of data sets across the board. Yeah, I mean, the heart's tough. The heart is uh, a complex, beautiful machine and has a lot of moving parts. Hard to intervene, intervene there. Uh, but then, Arun, on the other hand, you have the blood, which I love to talk about. The blood, which, you know, a single cell, silver bullet. You could treat the whole mess. Uh, but, of course, that's as elusive as therapies in the heart. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we don't really understand what cells give rise to what, right? The standard model of hematopoiesis places hematopoietic stem cells at the apex. And then there's all the descendant minion progenitor cells that emerge in this kind of stepwise manner. Um, this is all based on early, early studies in the bone marrow, right? You get these intermediate progenitors discovered in the bone marrow. Where do they come from? There's a stem cell that you can put them in vitro and you get the hierarchical progression to all the different blood cells. Um, and that, you know, intuitively it was a nice system. And in the last decade or more, there's been a little bit uh, of Merck introduced to that picture. It turns out there's cells of intermediate uh, potential as we were kind of alluding to in that sea star story in the, in the beginning is that there's cells all along a spectrum, right? Um, and particularly, there's been this kind of a, a disconnect, right? Because in development, uh, there's this, like in the bone marrow in the adult, but in development, there's this hematopoietic stem cell progenitor hierarchy that takes place in the fetal liver in, in late gestation. And it's been thought that that was that classic paradigm. You get a hematopoietic stem cell that generates all the descendants and so on and so forth. Um, but one, that's based on this, I, I guess, potentially specious assumption that things happen the same way in development as they do in the adult, which we know is not the case in many uh, stem cell niches. Um, but more than that, there is just kind of a practical consideration that there, there's this really rapid formation of the HSC progenitor hierarchy in the fetal liver, like all at once, boom. Uh, three or four days after the initial HSCs emerge in the AGM. And it's hard to reconcile the, the kinetics that you get a HSC in the AGM and then boom, you have all these cells in, in, the, in the fetal liver. So owing to that discrepancy or difficulty in, in reconciling those two observations, the group of Toshio Suda, who's at Kumamoto University in Japan, they used uh, in vivo genetic lineage tracing in mice to really distinguish these two in, in, uh, phenomena, the initial HSC formation and the fetal liver expansion. Um, and they did this by focusing on formation in these HSCs uh, and progenitors from intra-arterial -art hematopoietic clusters. And that was based on this unique mouse that they have called hepatic leukemia factor Cree. They had a HLF Cree mouse that allowed them to do these lineage tracing kinetic studies. And what they found, which was really, you know, upsetting to the dogma, uh, and it's why it's a nature article, is that there's a simultaneous formation of the these HSCs as well as their defined progenitors 
Um, and they both happen from this HLF positive uh, precursor population, but um, they happen in an independent manner. Uh, and that's really critical because, you know, the idea of this unique uh, monolithic paradigm of HSC to the progenitors, now it seems like there's a little bit of a parallel emergence. And mechanistically, which is what brought up to the level of nature, they showed that there's a transcription factor EB1, EB, EBI1, that's uh, variably expressed within that HLF Cre positive population. And the EV1 high cells uh, are the ones that preferentially give rise to the HSC phenotype, the hematopoietic stem cell phenotype. Uh, and then they go on to show that if they manipulate the EV1 expression, essentially increase or decrease the expression, they can alter the ratio of HSCs to progenitors in vivo in a mouse. So, I mean, this is a big study for me because I love the blood, but also conceptually, you know, it upsets decades of dogma in this monolithic HSC differentiation paradigm, but really specific to our field, Arun, and pluripotent cells is that this is a recipe, one, for understanding a distinction between these two uh, differentiation paradigms within uh, human or other pluripotent stem, stem cell system, but also this, this idea, this, this way of increasing HSC yield by uh, ectopically expressing EB1. I mean, groups including, you know, all the big names, daily, et cetera, have, have come up with transcription factor mediated reprogramming or direct reprogramming to cells that have uh, engraftment ca capacity, hematopoietic stem-like cells. This is like a, I don't wanna call it a silver bullet, uh, it's probably saying too much, but EB1, a single factor that may uh, significantly increase the yield of HSCs in a pluripotent stem cell system. I'll be waiting to see if that's how it pans out. I'm sure there's a lot of people firing it up on GeneScript right now to get their lentivirus or adenovirus EB1 right now. Yeah, before I pop your balloon here, Daylon, I mean, I, I do want to say that, uh, you know, even though Crelox has received a lot of bad publicity over the years, you know, given its leakiness and all that, it's still, as you can see in this paper and other papers like it, it's still very powerful for, for lineage tracing and it's still a workhorse across the world. So shout out to my Crelox folks out there. Um, but now I'm going to pop your balloon because as we've discussed multiple times on the show, Although you're, you know, the dream would be yes, you overexpress EB1 and you get amazing HSC differentiation in vitro. But as we've discussed in the show, a lot of this is so dependent on the in vivo niche, right? The in vivo niche and how it specifies and plays a role in the proper differentiation of especially HSCs. As I'm not an HSC biologist, but I feel like I've become one, an expert on the niche, just because of how many stories we've had that have reflected on the importance of the niche, niche in specifying uh, HSCs properly. So, you know, I think uh, down the road, yes, you know, hopefully that's that's all it is. We just need one to two factors to really drive HSC differentiation to its maximum potential. But I'm being a little pessimistic here, Daylon. Arun, why are you blowing up my bubble, man? Uh, I, I'm with you. But as the <laughs> Sea Star story told us at the outset, you know, the, the niche is a factor, this core signaling uh transduction pathways. I think that was key there in the C star, if you want to see what controls cell fate. But I will say that signaling converges on transcription factors, which then mobilizes signaling um, and, and so on and so forth. So having a, a cell intrinsic uh, mediator of HSC identity, I think is a really important piece of the puzzle. And of course, we need to examine how these EV1 overexpressed cells manifest in the niche, right? I, I totally agree with you. I think the first thing and probably what uh, the, the pseudo group is doing right now is they're looking in the mouse at the niche factors and how they collaborate with the EB1 overexpressing cells to exert that increased HSC phenotype. But yeah, I mean, every little thing we can do to get toward a bona fide HSC, Arun, that's my, my goal to observe that happening from my armchair here. And EB1 seems to be another piece of the puzzle. So I'm, I'm for one, my bubble is intact. Nothing you could do to me, Holmes. 
<laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. And yeah, I mean, this is just one step towards the ultimate goal and everything helps. I think maybe it's going to be a cocktail of these factors. Ultimately, that's going to be required to have that proper HSC differentiation in vitro. You know, who knows? Maybe we'll wake up tomorrow and it'll all be solved. Probably not, but we can dream, right? Anyway, so we're going to stick with uh, something blood related here, tangential. This is actually a nature method story uh, titled De Novo Construction of the T-Cell Compartment in Humanized Mice Engrafted with iPSC-Derived Thymus Organoids. I think this is a really cool approach because it's combining organoid biology with some um, bioengineering and, and scaffolding technology here as, as well to answer a really important question in, in the development of humanized mice for T-cell applications for understanding the immune system development. So these hematopoietic humanized or HU mice are really powerful tools and have been around for a while. You know, they can model the action of the immune system to some extent as, as much as you can in a mouse system, but you're looking at the human immune system, right? There's kind of a disconnect there, but you know, it's, it's what we can do. It's a decent model. Uh, they're widely used for preclinical studies and drug discovery, different labs, institutes, industry applications around the world, but generating a functional human T cell compartment in these humanized mice, these hematopoietic human humanized mice is challenging. And there's a few reasons for this. I mean, the main thing is like what I just alluded to, there's species specific differences here between the, the human and the mouse thymus, which is important for generating T cells. And so people have tried to get around this in different ways. You can engraft, of course, human fetal thymic tissues to, so you know, that'll support robust T cell development in these HU mice. But as you might expect, there's not a huge amount of those tissues available for, for use. And there's certainly ethical considerations too, right? For, for using fetal, fetal tissues. Here, they're using a tissue engineering based approach of taking human thymus organoids derived from iPSCs, iPSC derived thymus and in particular thymic epithelial cells derived from iPSCs, again, human, uh, that can actually support the de novo generation of a diverse population of functional human T cells. So what they did is, you know, they, they took uh, the T cells from, you know, uh, human T cells, CD, CD34 positive derived T cells, combined them with this scaffolded approach, um, this, you know, decellularized murine thymus put these CD34 positive H H HPCs in there, and then also in incorporated their iPSC-derived uh, organoids, iPSC-derived human thymic epithelial progenitor organoids to create all together in this tissue engineered approach, a quote unquote human thymic organoid, which is pretty supportive for the development of, of human T cells and taking this uh, hematopoietic humanized mouse model to the next level. And they showed that it's it's pretty advanced, it's pretty functional. It can mediate both cellular and humoral immune responses, a robust pro-inflammatory response on, on T-cell receptor engagement. Uh, and a really cool late part of this story in one of the, the final figures was they did an allogenic tumor graft and showed that it could inhibit the, the tumor graft by you know putting the tumor into the mice and also facilitating Ig class switching. So it's a really, I think, really powerful system to take this HU mouse to the next level and make it more humanized as if it can be, uh, and in particular to, to better understand T cell biology. And perhaps this can be adapted by different groups around the world who are trying to improve T cell biology, improve the differentiation and production of T cells and the application of T cells and looking at different tumor models as well. Um, and this is, as we know, with CAR-T, an extremely hot topic. And I think having good model systems to study how T cells are properly functioning, I think is really important. Things are just going so fast, Arun. I feel like it's, it's a science boomer. The, uh, you know, I talk about with my trainees now, uh, how things used to be. I sound like my mom. The, used to have to make a blastocyst to get an embryo, right? Not anymore. We got the synthetics. Here's a indication of how we used to have to use fetal tissue. Not so much anymore for these humanized mice. And it's really a hotbed. I, I heard this radio lab. I don't know. Radio labs kind of slipped in my esteem, but I heard this one that was kind of cool because it was sciencey about the thymus and all this newfangled stuff that they were doing. It's a bit far out and, you know, 
science fiction. But uh, the field is hot and the applications, as you alluded to with CAR-T, are diverse and tremendously impactful. But yeah, I just want to get back to that point. The real thing for me here is how we're obviating all the things that you know may get dicey. We used to have to destroy a blastocyst to generate embryonic stem cells, enter iPS cells. I feel like we're knocking down all the issues and obstacles to any kind of scientific endeavor. And this is maybe not deliberately so to avoid having to use fetal research, uh, fetal tissue. But um, I think for me, one of the takeaways here is that we're finding new ways to make systems and models that are kind of bulletproof in terms of any kind of ethical uh, criticism and also will really expand not only the practicality in terms of the scale of the work, but there's going to be all kinds of, you know, genetic engineering, CRISPR modification that you can do in this case to incorporate new science uh, using this system. So for me, a, a, a huge story, uh, only the, the most uh, earth shaking and, and science moving methods make it into nature methods, in my opinion. And this is one of them. Yeah, I agree with you on the science. I think this is really an, an amazing resource for the T cell community. I kind of disagree with you on the the ethics side of things because with our new model systems, you know, they have their own ethical considerations as well. You know, I mean, we'll talk to Jun Wu and also Jacob Hanna down the road, and certainly some of these synthetic embryos and even the blastoids have their own rules, regulations. They're getting a lot of popular press, and people are spinning them the wrong way. Are they powerful for studying early development of biology? Absolutely. But it's not to say that they're devoid of their own ethical issues. And of anytime you generate a more advanced humanized mouse model, that also has problems too, because some people are saying, oh man, these things are becoming more and more like human, even if it's not necessarily in a neural context, it's an immune system context, but still some people have their ethical considerations when it comes to that kind of work. So you're never gonna make everybody happy, you just got to do the best science you can and really do closely think about the ethics and consult with the experts when you're when you're making these kind of technologies. Fair point. Fair point, Arun. I agree 100 percent, although I'm going to have to have a chat with that person who's upset about uh, a mouse with a human thymus. All right. <laughs> I don't know what you got to cry about over there. We're going to have to bring some of these questions to Ed Grow. He, he certainly uh, has has dealt and, and wrestled with um, some of these ethical conundrums himself. But before we get to that, we have a quick message from Stem Cell Technologies. Take your human pluripotent stem cell cultures further with MTeaser Plus from Stem Cell Technologies. The most widely published medium for feeder-free human ES and IPS cell maintenance is now formulated for enhanced performance and versatility. MTeaser Plus reduces medium acidosis for more stable cultures all weekend long. To learn more, visit www.stemcell.com slash mteaser plus. All right, everybody, on today's episode, we have joining us Dr. Edward Grow, who is assistant professor at the Green Center for Reproductive Biological Sciences at University of Texas Southwestern. The Grow Lab studies reproductive biology, specifically the development of the egg and subsequently the fertilized embryo. They use genome-wide, single-cell, and computational approaches to deeply understand epigenome and transcriptome landscapes and how they are reprogrammed. In particular, they focus on the molecular event known as embryonic genome activation, the exciting final act in the egg-to-embryo transition that is largely driven by the egg. Dr. Grove, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to have you, particularly because yours is a research focus that is very close to my own interests. But unlike me, you've really zeroed in on a specific window during development, the activation of the embryonic genome. What is it about this that fascinates you so, and how is it important, not just to our basic understanding of human developmental biology, but also for our clinical application of pluripotent cells? Right. So um, for your listeners, zygotic genome activation or ZGA, or we call it EGA or embryonic genome activation in humans is a very peculiar molecular event, right? And so probably your listeners are aware that sperm and eggs um, in their mature form do not create new RNAs, right? They're transcriptionally quiescent. And that quiescence is maintained in the early embryo. And um, when transcription starts at the process of EGA, the genes that are turned on 
are not sperm or egg genes, but they're genes to help to build the embryo. And so there's a very abrupt cell identity change that happens during this window that allows for the development of the embryo. And um, this quiescence to activation is really specific uh, to this stage in development. It doesn't happen in any other stage as far as we know. And so understanding how that reprogramming happens during this quiescence um, to allow for this totipotency at CGA is really the focus of uh, my research. And so it might seem like kind of an esoteric topic to people outside of the field, but um, CGA is actually required for development, right? If you don't do CGA, then you arrest at those early stages. And clinically, that's a phenotype that we see quite often in the fertility clinic where the eggs that we um, fertilize uh, for reproductive purposes, um, many of them arrest at those early cleavage stages and are incapable of activating their ZGA program. And that leads to embryo loss, right? And so we're dealing with a very small cohort of embryos typically, and we want to maximize the developmental rate of those embryos. Yeah, it's such a hot topic what you're focusing on these days. It's um, really in part because of these amazing new technologies that have emerged in the field recently. Uh, let's actually briefly talk about one of your other recent papers, a nature genetics paper, where you actually showed that P53 activates the transcription factor ducts in embryonic stem cells and in face you escape you humoral muscular dystrophy models. That's a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> it's a really neat combo dev bio disease modeling kind of story with some evolutionary bio built in as well. And also linking back to a gene in ducts that's important for regulating totipotency in mouse embryonic stem cells. So tell us a little bit more about this particular work and how it got started and what's next for you. Right. So this was kind of... Um, it was a really interesting route that we took to, to work on this project. So as a little bit of background, um, we had discovered that this transcription factor called Dux is really the main driver of um, this in vitro counterpart called 2C-like cells or 2-cell-like embryo cells in culture. And in the embryo, it's responsible for turning on um, the earliest wave of gene expression at ZGA. And so it's really the master regulator of this process. Um, we think in most mammals, it can be... Um, functionally redundant with another gene in mouse, but um, this ducts transcription factor is really the key, we think, to understanding how the embryo transitions from this quiescence period to activation. And uh, when we started the project, we knew that this transcription factor was important for the process, but we really didn't understand how it was regulated. And we thought that by studying the way that the ducts transcription factor was turned on zygotically, that was gonna be the key to understanding how that decision is made um, in the embryos it transitions. And so I think um, originally when we started the project, we were using the two seal like system um, to study this. And your listeners are probably aware that this is a small stochastic fluctuating population in embryonic stem cells that acquire this um, two cell like transcriptome and um, are functionally totipotent, um, which makes them a very interesting in vitro model. And um, this process is driven by ducts. And so we decided to use that cellular model to um, model how the embryo turns on ducts. And what we found was that very surprisingly, um, chemicals that create DNA damage are very potent inducers of ducts. And that was the first, you know, kind of aha moment where we thought, well, there's a lot of damage that happens in the early embryo with transcription onset, et cetera. And so maybe this is some uh, mechanism that the embryo uses this damage or this insult um, in order to turn on a specific gene expression program. And it's not just stress or it's not just chemicals like doxorubicin or cisplatin, these genotoxic drugs that can induce ducts. But also if you just overexpress an endonuclease, which causes double-stranded breaks, we can also trigger a pathway that activated ducts. And so um, many people are familiar with the DNA damage response, which is this conserved transcriptional response that happens in cells when you incur um, DNA damage, where you activate uh, the signaling pathway that stabilizes P53 and P53 is a strong transcriptional activator that turns on, you know, senescence and cell cycle arrest and repair um, and apoptosis, cell death. But in embryonic stem cells, it does a totally different thing, which was totally, uh, you know, surprising to us. It actually activates ducts and the ducts network, which allows for this two cell like uh, cell fate to appear. And so that was very non canonical as far as we know. Um, it's totally different than other somatic cells. So that was the first kind of key that P53 was involved in activating ducts um, using this uh, cellular model of 2C-like cells and mouse cells. And we went on to show that P53 is important for ducts reactivation um, at ZGA in the mouse embryo, but it's not required. So there appears to be some redundant pathway that also um, 
uh, activates ducts in the mouse embryo. But I think what really fascinated us was, you know, we're developmental biologists and we were interested in how the embryo makes this decision to transition from quiescence to activation. And ducts was our key um, factor that we were studying. But we realized early on that the phenomenon of 2C-like cells, which are stochastically fluctuating, is actually very analogous to FSHD, um, this fasciosscapular humeral muscular dystrophy that occurs in humans in which they also have this stochastic population of muscle cells that reactivate ducts. And the disease is actually caused by essentially ZGA that happens in their muscle cells, which is very unusual, right? You wanna restrict that uh, transcriptional program to the very early embryo. And by reactivating that of the muscle cells, you cause this disease. And so there was this really interesting disease connection that's essentially caused by the reactivation of this CGA um, program through ducts in uh, those patients. Wow, that's amazing. And it, re it really illustrates how you live in, in two worlds, right? I mean, fun listening to you, it, it's, it's obvious that you're a real basic, basic scientist. I mean, you're working at the at the first moments of life of organisms right in these first cell divisions and what it takes for for them to really get out on their own right i guess so to speak um but there you just illustrated how this basic fundamental process at the root of an organism's life can also be related to this disease that affects people and and you know by the same token you're working in a in a reproductive biology context there where like every day i'm sure you're seeing how these fundamental processes can have an impact on reproductive health, right? And infertility and, and solving those problems, it can be devastating. Um, I don't know about as devastating as terminal disease, but I'm sure it feels that way. Uh, um, but also, you know, there's this whole other angle there, which is the basic, basic you. And that was, you know, first illustrated to me in one of your early and in, in high impact stories in nature. It was a while back. I mean, back in 2015, but I can remember it um, specifically. You got a distinctive name is one thing, but more because uh, Joanna Wasika, who, who uh, was at Rockefeller University when I was there um, for my uh, doctoral work, um, I've always followed her work. And also I can remember thinking when that paper came out, you know, kudos to you, Joanna, but also what a great Evo Devo application of pluripotent stem cells. And I think in the intervening years, we've seen that really pick up a lot of steam. Madeline Lancaster, others have really used the pluripotent stem cells to that uh, effect as well. But the second thing that occurred to me, it was so disconcerting that endogenous retroviruses seem to be quietly going about their life cycle and perhaps mucking around with our own development. Uh, am I being over dramatic there? Are we really just like a vessel for retroviruses created by our future alien overlords or something uh, to that effect? Right, we're just an elaborate vessel for uh, the replication of transposons. You know, I think a lot of the people in the transposon field would say that, you know, we're the parasite, right? And the, the transposons are the things that are transmitting. So what do you think uh, is really the relevance there in terms of that uh, early genome activation? Is the, are the retroviruses there uh, making it such that like in mouse, for instance, you get the genome activation at two cell versus in human, it, it, it's later at eight cell stage or cleavage stages. Is it, is it the retroviruses that have in, you know, integrated into the human genome since the evolution of a uh, higher order? Or what, what, what goes on there? Right. So I think you can't really understand and appreciate this process until you really think about how it evolved over many millions of years. And so um, ERVs, or endogenous retroviruses, are these proviruses that exist in the genome of many species. Um, and they um, have a very strong selective pressure to become active in the early embryo or in germ cells, right? Um, those are the two cell types that will contribute to the germline. And so they, over time, tune themselves to become activated, right? And they evolve to capture um, transcription factors that are expressed at those stages. And then over time, there's kind of an arms race, right? They uh, contribute to the genome, and then um, the cell can't mutate away some of those transcription factors that activate them, right? Because the transcription factors are required to turn on other important genes. And so there's kind of a spy versus spy that plays out over millions of years where these herbs um, are able to be activated, and then there's some type of antagonistic relationship with the host that might try to silence them. And then over very long periods of time, they contribute you know, very strong regulatory sequences to the genome that then kind of become 
co-opted or rewired the host gene expression, right? And so that's what we've seen in humans and mouse in particular, that these endogenous retroviruses make very strong promoters or enhancers that then drive the expression of cellular host genes. And so they're kind of this entangled co-evolution that happens um, to integrate them into the, the genome regulatory landscape. Hmm. And it seems like we're really in the middle of a kind of a golden age of reproductive biology, especially when it comes to like how reproductive and early development of biology is intersecting with stem cell science, like what we're talking about here today. And I actually mentioned it on a recent episode, and I'll say it again. If I was a junior trainee in the field in stem cell biology, deciding which subfield to enter right now, I would choose your field, you know, early reproductive and early development of biology. It's just so exciting, so much cool stuff going right now. And a big part of that is the, you know, amazing new technologies that are emerging in your field, right? We talk about them all the time on the show, blastoids in part pioneered by your colleague at UT Southwestern, Jun Wu, and other systems like gastroloids and so on. And of course, we'll talk about Jacob Hanna's recent bombshell in a, in a little bit, uh, but could you reflect a little bit on this golden age and early development of biology that we're going through right now and about some of these new developmental model systems like the blastoids that are just emerging right now? Right. So that's a very good point. I think that unless you have a little bit of this larger perspective, you can't appreciate that we're really definitely in a renaissance right now in terms of studying early embryo. And I think probably the past decade or so has really been an exciting time because the technology in order to study these um, early developmental stages or germ cells has really matured, right? And so the early embryo has very few cells and it was really difficult to get enough physical material to do, you know, genomic or epigenomic experiments for a long time. And so it really took the advance in those methods to be able to understand the transcriptome, the epigenome of the early embryo or of germ cells, and um, the miniaturization of functional genomics, right, has uh, happened in the past decade. And so now we're actually, be, we can figure out um, the genes that turn on and the regulatory elements that drive that process. And with CRISPR and with stem cell models, you can perturb that system to understand um, how the contribution of herbs or um, uh, contribute to the gene expression in, in the embryo. Yeah, I mean, as you uh, just uh, mentioned, we you got to appreciate what a renaissance this is. And as, as Arun introduced um, really well there, for, for a long while, anyone interested in embryonic events between the blastocysts or pre-implantation stages and post-gastrula stages would just throw up their hands and allude to the black box surrounding peri-implantation development, rightfully. Um, Enter the Hanna group, and I, I don't want to, like, you know, go crazy here. This is not, we're not talking about embryogenesis and gastrulation outside of the black box necessarily yet. But um, in a couple of years, he seemingly pioneered the framework for this complete ex vivo development. Um, and I think we're maybe on that path. Uh, um, we'll see. Um, now, of course, I, I'm sure you're just fine exploring the rabbit hole that is pre-implantation embryogenesis and there's you know hundreds of careers that can be made just in that work but i'm just curious like does that the whole idea of these synthetic embryos um specifically knowing that they can be assembled and have the capacity to go through these gastrula stages and form at least rudimentary organogenesis organogenesis like does it open up your specific research horizons at, at all um and whether or not it does what do you think it means uh for reproductive biology and medicine. Right. So I think, you know, I'm pretty focused on the early pre-implantation stages. And actually, I'm not going forward. I'm going backwards to study how the egg develops and how, you know, the egg prepares for this process during follicular genesis. But I think what people have realized, um, you know, from work in both clinical human samples, but also in, you know, animal agriculture is that you can make a pre-implantation embryo and it looks like a, a relatively normal structure, but its developmental competence after implantation can be very, can be varied, right? So sometimes that's successful, um, completes gestation, sometimes it doesn't. So I think understanding, you know, those subtle changes that probably accumulate during the pre-implantation period, the epigenetic, um, you know, scars, as we think about them as being kind of long lived things that perturb the development of the embryo after implantation. Now we have, you know, these in vitro models that you can study how that would manifest, right? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about really, really early development. And I mean, there have been a 
number of studies recently pursuing this acquisition of the so-called totipotent state or something really close to it, totipotent meaning the ability to give rise to the embryonic and extra embryonic tissues too. And remember we covered a paper recently, we actually, I think, had a brief discussion on Twitter about it, about the induction of mouse totipotent totipotent quote unquote stem cells using a chemical cocktail. What are your thoughts on these studies that are pursuing this one of these holy grails of developmental biology, the long-term maintenance of the, the totipotent state, you know, you know, the acquisition and maintenance of these totipotent stem cells. Are we are we there yet? Are we just kind of spinning the wheels trying to get there? How reproducible are these studies? What do you think about these these studies? Right. So I think um I remember this conversation that we had. Um, there's a you know, several people have now reported in the mouse system that this combination of 2 lif and retinoic acid signaling can activate this totipotent program. So it's been um, reported by several groups. And so I think that they're definitely onto something um, that this very unusually specific, you know, retinoic acid signaling, we normally think about as acting much later in embryonic development, but it appears to, at least in mouse, be active early on. Um, in the embryo, and these groups have kind of stumbled across this discovery that by, um, you know, constraining the embryonic stem cells by a 2 eye lift culture and trapping them in this pluripotent state, but then adding this typically pro-differentiation state, you presumably can culture them, you know, long-term, or you can stabilize that two cell-like state, which previously was very transient and was sta stochastically gained and fluctuated through. So I think, you know, time will tell if other people, you know, really adopt this method and use it um, in their own research, but, you know, I think that they're onto something and I think it provides us the opportunity to really, you know, capture different stages of pre-implantation at, um, different discrete points, right? So we can, can we capture totipotent cells that have a ZGA signature? Can we capture, you know, more stage embryos that are pre-lineage that haven't made that decision yet that should also be functionally totipotent? I think that that's a really exciting, uh, development in the field that's going to help us do those models of embryoids or um, synthetic embryos with uh, potentially um, easier methods. So you just said, I mean, this, on this show, generally, we focus on pluripotent, some kind of potency, totipotent, pluri, whatever, or, uh, you know, uh, clinical endpoints, organs, organogenesis, uh, tissues, et cetera, things that can be used to, to address degenerative disease, et cetera. But, um, you said it just now, you're kind of going backwards. You know, we're talking about the oocyte to embryo transition for the most part on the show, but you said it, you're going backwards. And the oocyte for me is a miracle in itself. Most biologists know that a woman is born with all the eggs she'll ever have. Uh, although some, uh, among some circles that remains controversial, I don't know how, but uh, a common misconception, uh, uh, even amongst the most educated of us is that eggs wake up and pop out month to month with the menstrual cycle. And the reality as you know, is that the growth process between waking of a primordial quiescent follicle in the ovary and ovulation of the egg contained in that follicle actually takes place over the course of many months, you know, maybe six months or more in mini organs of the ovary called follicles, which are composed at the end of like millions, literally, of nurse cells that foster a single oocyte to maturity over the course of this, you know, six months, let's say. Um, and more importantly, of around a million follicles that are present in the ovary at birth, you'll only get around 400 of those oocytes contained within that'll undergo the reproductive cycle and reach maturity over the course of menses, over 400 cycles, let's say, and generate a competent egg. So part of your work, and I love this, uh, I want to link up with you after the chat here and, and see where we can put our heads together. Part of your work aims to improve the ex vivo culture of follicles and oocytes. Tell me about this. How do you go about it? And, and what is the endpoint? You alluded to it earlier, but what's the clinical endpoint specifically in your lab of that work? Right. And so you can kind of take, you know, two different approaches where you can focus on, you know, doing this from an applied translational um, method where we want to use it for reproductive purposes and, you know, the human IVF clinic, or we want to use it for agricultural purposes and animals. This process of taking follicles out of the ovary and growing them um, and, uh, you know, it requires making the oocytes happy. And the way to do that is to make the somatic cells happy, right? The somatic cells of the follicle are really the cells that um, nourish and um, keep the oocyte in its meiotic rest. 
And so really, it is just another tissue culture engineering problem. And I've been working in, you know, tissue culture and stem cell culture for a long time. So I thought, you know, this is something that's tractable now that we have these really sensitive epigenomic and transcriptomic techniques. We should be able to find the right secret sauce, right, the right combination of culture conditions or growth factors that allow the somatic cells to be happy and make the oocyte happy as it continues to develop over, as you said, this very long period of time where there's this careful developmental maturation of the oocyte um, in you know, humans, folliculogenesis is a, is a pretty long process. In mouse, where it's much more efficient to do this in vitro culture, it's much shorter. And so it's been a lot easier to do that. But I think moving this type of technology where we can grow these follicles like Spibo into other species human, other agricultural animals that have a totally different timeline for follicular genesis is going to be important, right? Um, and eventually, you can imagine this process of growing a follicle ex vivo could be used for, you know, couples that either, um, you know, are not good candidates for stimulation or have a diminished ovarian reserve or for cryopreservation for, um, you know, oncofertility purposes in humans, right? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the applications are almost unlimited as you're discussing. And sometimes in our conversations, I like to be on a fly on the wall, just kind of sitting back and listening to you guys talk about these topics that you're so, so passionate about in early developmental biology. So thank you for taking me to school, both of you for <laughs> this particular topic. I mean, we love highlighting new PIs on the show and certainly you are a new PI. You've started up your own laboratory at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. I mean, it's no secret that UT Southwestern has emerged as a clinical and basic science powerhouse over the last couple of decades and, and beyond. And in my own field in cardiovascular biology, I'm not an early developmental biologist, apologies. Uh, you know, for cardiovascular biology, it's one of the premier research institutions in the country and the world, in part, thanks to the leadership of Dr. Eric Olson, who's an icon in our field. Um, and certainly in your field, there are other emerging icons like Dr. Jun Wu, a friend of the show and a pioneer in early developmental models, as we've discussed. And it's always fun to pick the brains of junior investigators and think about what went into that decision of, you know, why did you decide to go to UT, UT Southwestern to start up your own lab? And, and so tell us, why, why are you there? Why do you love UT Southwestern? And uh, just tell us about the place. Right. So I, um, I, as you alluded to, I've worked in basic science for a long time. And the Green Center, where um, I have my primary appointment, is a really interesting place because it's a basic science center but it's um, affiliated with the ob guy department. And so um, the people that are in the Green Center, there's some real hardcore reproductive biologists, which is great, but in general, people are very interested in molecular mechanism. And so that was one of the major reasons why I decided to come here. And um, particularly molecular mechanism within the Green Center, there's this kind of um, critical mass of people that are interested in transcription and chromatin biology and enhancer biology. So it's a really unique place where we're working in reproductive biology or you know, um, reproductive biology adjacent, but the people are all very interested in kind of detailed mechanistic um, processes that happen with transcription regulation and, and chromatin. So it's a really great place to have that critical mass of colleagues. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I've, I've said it before and I'll say it now again, reproductive biology is dope. It's a playground where you get the convergence of like the new tech, there's like real life clinical results there where you're making babies and changing lives. And as you're talking about here, there's all this basic science that, you know, is, is directly relevant to, to reproduction and embryo development, but also has much broader implications in just genome regulation. So I love repro and it's really great to have a reproductive biologist and a scientist who's focused on on the show, because I've said it also, complaining, all I do is complain on the show, reproductive is, is dope, but it gets no run. It's hard to get a grant with repro. It's hard to get any you know attention. I, I found a new cell in the follicle, Ed, a new cell in the follicle, and they're kicking me down to some, you know, sub 10 impact factor journals. I'm, I'm complaining, I'm not bitter about it. I'm just glad to get it out. But I think that our star is rising, my friend. I think that Repro is on the ascent and it's where a lot of these new technologies are gonna be tried and uh, really gonna bear great fruit. So thanks for joining us on the show. I'm not letting you go yet. We got a couple science adjacent questions that we got to hit you with. And the first of that is, uh, if you could answer any single scientific question, regardless of your expertise or chosen field, 
what would it be? Okay, so as a biologist, I think we're all obsessed with the origin of life, right? How did life evolve or how did life evolve on Earth, right? What were those early steps um, that allowed for life to be created from, uh, you know, very early inorganic precursors? And then, of course, as a, somebody who's worked in the virology field for a long time, I think there's kind of a missing gap in the evolutionary tree in terms of how did viruses evolve, Right. When did they evolve? And there's a certain amount of um, variation between different viruses, RNA viruses, DNA viruses, et cetera. Where did they come from? Right. Their origin is kind of mysterious in a lot of ways. We know a little bit about retroviruses, where they came from. But I think the origin of life, and that's really intimately tied up with the origin of viral life on Earth. I think that's the biggest question. Yeah, that's deep. That is deep in the soup, the primordial soup. But uh, yeah, that's that's a, a great one. And uh, finally, what is the biggest misconception about science that you would like to resolve? Okay, so I have a controversial uh, answer and I have a non-controversial answer. Maybe I'll go with the non-controversial one. Um, I think that uh, basic science is really important. I think, um, you know, in the past couple of years, we've seen how if you fund people to do basic science and um, allow them to just be driven by their curiosity, all of these um, observations and discoveries over time can be strung together, right, as pieces of the puzzle in order to do something really fantastic. So I think, you know, the mRNA vaccines are an amazing example of that. If you think back to like the early days of molecular biology, where people were working on phages and phage transcription um, and the very earliest days of molecular biology, I mean, nobody knew at that time that they were gonna discover an in vitro transcription system that was gonna make an mRNA vaccine you know, 50 years down the road. And so I think there are so many examples of these really important basic biology discoveries that are funded um, in large part by our government and then take time to really kind of trickle down into some useful application often. I think that that's a, a critical investment that you know we've really been fortunate in our country that we've supported that over many decades. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? These amazing scientific discoveries get laid at the feet of, of individuals or groups. And rightfully, I mean, they, they, they put it all together, but it's really built on the aggregate of so many, you know, literally millions of ideas that have been funded uh, by, you know, these altruistic institutes that really have a benefit to society. You got to give us the, the controversial answer, though, too, Ed. <laughs> Okay, so controversial answer. I think, you know, I know that you have listeners all over the world, but I think we're in uh, the US right now in the States. And I think that over the past couple of years, uh, we've seen kind of a misperception of what science is. Um, I think science is, you know, the process of inquisition and this, uh, the process of collecting data and making conclusions about um, the evidence that you collect. And it's an iterative process, which means that as you collect more data or more evidence, you can change your model or change your hypothesis about how something works. And I think that there's kind of a misconception in, um, in I don't know, I guess the general public that uh, everything is settled science, but as scientists, you know that you're constantly refining and constantly building upon some observations. And I think that process is normal, right? As we discover new things, we have to change um, the way we understand the, the mechanism of how something works. And I think, um, if people could kind of, you know, embrace that, uh, the process of science as opposed to science is, you know, an outcome. The science is not what's in the textbook. The science is the process of discovery. I think that um, our society would be in a better place. So that's my controversial answer. That's the truth, my friend. I mean, <laughs> it may be controversial in some circles, but that's just the reality. My mother-in-law, I was talking to her recently, and she was lamenting the, the outcome of the vaccine, which I think was great. But they, you know, 97% effective. And she said, I just wish the scientists had told us when they came out with the information, told us what would, was going to happen. And I said, you know, Sue's my mother in law, I said, they didn't know. Um, and th the whole point is they, they shared the facts. 97% uh, effective is not a prediction, it's the results of the clinical trial. You know, scientists don't know the future, but they can share the truth. And uh, you've done a good job of, of, of really highlighting. Uh, the relevance and importance of that in society, but also with your work. And, and we appreciate both ends of that. And more than that, we appreciate you coming on the show and talking to us and our listeners. Ed, come back again. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. 
All right, guys, that brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or via email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with another UT investigator, June Wu. Until then, thank you so much for listening.